It's important to understand that Tertullian's understanding of freedom of religion was not that this was a legally enforceable right of an individual subject against the state. That kind of assumption would be anachronistic. When early Christians used the Latin term jus naturali, which we can translate as natural right, they were arguing that it is the natural and proper state of affairs that human beings seek the truth freely, according to their conscience. Coercion in matters of conscience violates the freedom of human beings created in God's image. So what emerges, in short, is the idea that following God is free in that it stems from the will, from the conscience. It cannot and ought not be coerced. To their minds, this freedom is part of the natural and proper ordering of the world. It is, in that sense, understood as a natural right. And therefore, for Perpetua and Felicitas, as well as for hundreds of others, conscience defined the limits of their obedience to the government. And historically, that idea of to what extent do we owe obedience to the government becomes an incredibly important idea. Now let's move forward to our next episode, which is really in the medieval and early modern world. Well, mapping the history of religious liberty requires understanding the categories of natural and positive law and the developing landscape of natural rights and natural law in the medieval and the early modern period. The reason for this is that historically, religious freedom, religious liberty, begins to be recognized as a natural right long before it actually becomes codified in the positive laws of particular countries and then in international law. So though many today, of course, in our audience have legal backgrounds, not all of us do, so I will just briefly explain, of course, that we can distinguish between two types of law, the positive law and the natural law. Positive laws are the laws of nations. They're created by human societies, in other words, and they apply to specific people in specific places. But by contrast, natural law is the idea that there exists a moral law which is universal. It's partly accessible to human reason. And so it applies, at least normatively, if not in practice, to all people in all places at all times. This is the natural law. And so by the time we get to the medieval world, Christians developed a natural law tradition, a way of thinking about natural law, which held that natural law is universal because it is established by God. Now, historically, religious freedom has been understood, as I mentioned, to be both part of the natural law as well as the positive law. Religious freedom is a right that's now protected by the positive laws of particular nations and in international law, but it's also understood to reflect a universal principle of the natural law. And indeed, the reason why religious freedom is enshrined in many cases of positive law, in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, for example, is because it's understood to be a principle of the natural law in the first place. Well, our next chapter in this story, in the medieval and the early modern period, is significant for both of these developments. Medieval jurisprudence was replete with arguments about rights that ought to be protected by the patchwork of laws, that is the church canon law, as well as the laws of particular states. These laws protected the rights and privileges of particular groups, not individuals as such. The ideas of that rights are equally held by all individual subjects before the law is really a fundamentally modern principle. So in other words, while medieval jurisprudence accorded various rights to particular groups, this in effect meant that individuals were treated differently before the law. Sometimes these limited legal rights amounted to a situation of conditional religious toleration, in which religious groups were permitted as communities certain rights to practice. So for example, the Jewish communities in various medieval cities had their right to observe the, the Sabbath. They protected, the, in many ways, the Magna Carta as well. This patchwork of rights and privileges was actually the medieval state's mode of governance. It maintained civil order by compartmentalizing and keeping separate groups, both legally and geographically distinct. As was the case of various Jewish communities, this legal situation occasionally amounted to a kind of religious toleration of both the beliefs and the practices of some religious minorities. Toleration, however, is not the same as religious freedom. Toleration is effectively a kind of pragmatic indulgence by the state to religious minorities. Those minorities, as a whole, don't possess the same rights as other subjects and citizens under the law. And so there are cases of religious toleration in Europe as well as outside of Europe. This is not something which is distinct to the Christian tradition. So, for example, in the Ottoman Empire, there's limited cases of religious toleration. But this is distinctly different from religious freedom. And in such societies, 
my, those minorities usually don't hold their beliefs or practices as actual rights, and they're still effectively second-class citizens. Now, the most significant development of this kind of long period is actually with regard to natural law. You recall from a moment ago that in the ancient world, Tertullian and others developed an argument that conscience ought to be protected because such a right was natural. It formed part of the natural law. Well, during the medieval and the early modern period, the concept jus naturali, which traditionally meant the proper and right ordering of the cosmos, began to acquire another sense. It began to imply that there were natural rights which might belong to individuals. One of the things that my current research is suggesting is actually that freedom of conscience became the archetypal natural right in many ways, because conscience was understood to lie at the ontological core of the human person. That biblical vision of the human being, which was the historical basis of all those natural rights claims, was that humanity was created in God's image and endowed with a rational conscience. Protecting that conscience subsequently became the basis for protecting other rights as well. These kind of claims are illustrated in the following vignette. Now, let's see if I get my clicker right this time. Here we go, yes. Now we're in the year 1502, when a young Spanish man, Bartolome de las Casas, journeyed to Hispaniola to partake in Spanish colonization. Las Casas lived in Hispaniola for a decade and witnessed numerous acts of the brutality of the conquistadors, including the execution of a rebel chieftain who was burned at the stake for not accepting baptism. Now, Bartolome experienced a change of heart. Originally, he was part of this, this group of conquistadors. And he then devoted the remainder of his life to defend the rights of the native inhabitants. Compulsion in faith is abhorrent, he argued in his work translated into English as In Defense of the Indians. Because compulsion makes what is a voluntary act of the will into an act of coercion. And his argument was this. The Indians are human beings, they're made in the image of God, and they're free to accept and reject or reject baptism precisely because of this natural freedom, what Las Casas called their naturale jus libertatis. The Indians were free people with natural rights. Las Casas argued that natural laws protected the political, the territorial, and the religious freedom of all peoples. He took his arguments back to Spain and became something of a thorn in the side of the Spanish condemning their brutality, uh, the brutality of their invasions, and colonialism on the basis that it, it violated natural rights. Well, the next moment in our story occurs in a little bit later in the 16th century when it was clear that much of the Western church was corrupt and there was something of a blurring of the church's authority with that of secular government. So now we're in the context of the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation began as an attempt to reform the Western Christian Church and rid it of corruption and unscriptural theology. According to Martin Luther, who we see up there, the church was extending its power well beyond its spiritual sphere where he wrote it ought to preach the word of God. And Luther wrote that the church ought to rule with God's word inwardly, but instead they rule castles, towns, countries and peoples outwardly and torment souls with unspeakable murders. Luther saw the proper jurisdiction of secular rulers as extending no further than what he called the body, goods, and outward earthly matters. So in effect, he's drawing a distinction between these two realms of authority. In fact, Luther argues, rulers are incapable of judging spiritual matters of faith and religion because, as Luther explained, faith resides not in the body but in the heart and cannot be reached by the sword of kings and princes. Luther argued that God had ordained two kingdoms, one spiritual, one temporal, for the ordering of his creation. And these two kingdoms had distinct responsibilities. Reformation thinkers like Luther and John Calvin and others had different ways of understanding how these different realms of authority would work together. And indeed, in some ways, Luther was effectively bolstering the power of the state against the church. But the key development from this period in terms of our history of religious freedom is that they are articulating that the role of the state is distinct from the role of the church. And central to these separate jurisdictions of power was the idea that the purpose of the state is not to enforce belief. Now, that idea that the state cannot compel belief appears in many ways modern and familiar to us, but we must not be anachronistic. In the 16th century, the assumption was that for the purposes of civil peace, 
Governments needed to establish one form of Christianity and protect it against all other forms of belief, including heresy. While the jurisdiction of the sword and the spirit separated government from church, there was still one official church in each state. Indeed, the extent of the established church's power to punish heresy and to maintain orthodox religion was a matter of considerable debate. As the case of Michael Servetus, who was executed in Calvin's Geneva for heresy in 1553 illustrates. It was actually often thinkers of the more radical win of the Reformation, like Sebastian Castilio, an ardent critic of Servetus's execution, who were more pronounced and deliberate even than Luther and Calvin about the necessity of religious toleration and the limits of the state's powers to enforce belief. Now, indeed, debates about conscience and the extent of its liberties lay at the heart of Reformation theology. Luther argued that each person must decide at his own peril what he is to believe and must see to it that he believes rightly. Other people cannot go to heaven or hell on my behalf or open the, or close the gates of either for me or force my faith or unbelief. How he believes is a matter for each individual's conscience. And I'm quoting there from uh, Luther's work on secular authority. There is, however, a bittersweet paradox to the Reformation. There was more religious violence in its aftermath than almost any other point in European history. And yet in spite of this, or perhaps because of it, the Reformation accelerated the rights, the development of the rights of conscience. In the winter of 1572, and this is the other uh, picture we have up here, on St. Bartholomew's Day, hundreds of people took to the streets and murdered French Calvinist Protestants. Within months, tens of thousands were killed by torture, drowning, and generally being slaughtered. The massacre helped inspire Calvin's successor in Geneva, Theodore Beza, to publish a work entitled Concerning the Rights of Rulers, which was actually one of the first tracks to argue that the natural right of conscience ought to be protected by governments. And Beza actually went further, theorizing that the origins of a commonwealth resided in the act of making a covenant. He actually calls it a covenant, a three-party agreement involving God, the ruler, and the people. And so in addition to acquiring obedience, requiring obedience to the laws of God and nature, the political covenant required political rulers to protect and promote what Beza called the rights and liberties and the privileges and freedoms of their subjects, which of course included the freedom of conscience. And this was an idea with profound consequences. Beza was effectively articulating a new conception of the purposes and responsibilities of government because it owed its existence to a contract or a covenant with the people, governments therefore were duty bound to protect certain natural rights and freedoms given by God to their subjects. Now, again, if this idea about government sounds familiar to us today, it's only because we live, as it were, several chapters later in this story. And so now let's move into, oh, there's Baser and Locke the 17th and 18th centuries. These ideas about the character and limitations of government were developed over the next century by theorists like Johannes Althusius and John Locke. Locke argued that religious toleration was in fact the chief characteristical mark of the true church, as he put it. And he defined the church as a voluntary society because religion is not something you can be born into. Locke was writing during 17th century England when monarchs repeatedly suppressed dissenting forms of religion. Many of the religious nonconformists, styling themselves Puritans, sought religious liberty in the Netherlands and then emigrated to America and established new commonwealths. A significant development occurred in some of the new American colonies because freedom of conscience as a natural right began to be codified as an individual right in the laws of some of these nascent polities in the Americas. Now we can have a look at Roger Williams here, who's our illustration of this. In the Massachusetts Bay Colony, private dissent from the state form of reformed Christianity was permitted, and this limited toleration extended, as their charter announced, to, and they call this, this is a quoting their charter, pagans, Jews, and atheists. But this was not enough for a young minister by the name of Roger Williams. Williams was a colorful character and a colorful writer, forcing people to adhere to a particular form of worship, he once wrote, stinks in God's nostrils. Williams rejected the very idea that there should be any formal establishment of religion. Toleration was not enough. True liberty of conscience, Williams believed, entailed what we would now call free exercise, the free practice of religion. 
William's views soon caused him to be exiled from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. With his pockets crammed full of dried corn paste, Williams fled into the backcountry, where his friendships with the local Indians enabled him to survive. Eventually, Williams wandered south and found himself at a cove fed by two rivers in an area called Narragansett Bay. In 1636, he organised to buy land from the Narragansett Indians, and he called it Providence. This place, as he put it, would be a place for persons distressed for conscience. Now, the government of Providence, which was a majoritarian democracy, established no religion whatsoever. And in terms of world history, this is radically new. According to Williams, it is the will and command of God that since the coming of his son, the Lord Jesus, a permission of the most paganish, Jewish, Turkish, which is code for Muslim, or even anti-Christian consciences and worships be granted to all men in all nations and all countries. In fact, the charter of the colony explicitly protected the freedom of conscience and practice for atheists. And I think here we see a, a glimmer of the idea of why freedom of conscience and freedom of religion has actually historically had results that protect non-believers as well. On what basis could Williams make the argument that religious liberty, make this argument about religious liberty and even have it protect the non-religious? So the, the freedom as it were not to have a religion or worship according to any established religion. Well, it rested upon Williams's conviction of the inherent and equal value of human beings created in God's image. All people were endowed with the ability to seek the truth, regardless of whether that truth would lead them to faith or to unbelief. Now, this is not to say that Williams was some moral relativist or that he believed that everyone's truth was equally true. Far from it. He was a committed Christian. So he believed that others were wrong in the same way that atheists in his colony and many others believed that he was wrong. But having the freedom to pursue the truth and to practice it was open to all people in Rhode Island precisely because all people were made in God's image. Because truth-seeking required proper understanding, Williams set about learning the various languages of the Native Americans in New England. He translated much of the Narragansett Indians language and published his book entitled A Key into the Language of America, which is one of the first studies of Native American languages. In that book, Williams rebuked his fellow English, reminding them of the fundamental equality of all people made in God's image. One of my favourite quotes reads, Boast not, proud English, of thy birth and blood. Thy brother Indian is by birth as good. Of one blood God made him and thee and all. When the 13 British colonies united to declare their independence from Great Britain and to form the United States of America, the colony that Williams founded, by then named Rhode Island, was the first to renounce its allegiance to the British crown. Here we can move to our... Here we are. The new nation, the United States of America, was a fundamentally new experiment because it was the first nation to disestablish religion entirely at law. It also enshrined religious liberty as a positive legal right in the First Amendment to the Constitution, which was adopted in 1791. And interestingly enough, that First Amendment is a good illustration of the close entwining of the bundle of rights to which freedom of conscience is related. So it reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging, and here are the other rights so closely related, freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So this presupposed that there existed natural rights which were endowed to humanity by God. James Madison, who wrote the First Amendment, was clear that that was the case. Now, meanwhile, across the Atlantic, philosophers of the Enlightenment were also making other claims about the importance of freedom of conscience. Let's have a look at the French, our French revolutionaries slide for a moment. The French revolutionaries declared freedom of conscience in Article 10 of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in 1789. Article 10 stated that no man may be disturbed for his opinions, even religious ones. The declaration made no reference to God, and yet Article 2 referred to the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. These are liberty, property, safety, and resistance against oppression. And interestingly, in terms of those natural rights, conscience isn't mentioned. Now, while the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen made no reference to God, it was written by three men who believed in a created God, despite their very unorthodox theology. The Declaration's authors, the ABCAs, Marquis de Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson all believed that natural rights existed because they were endowed by God. 
Fascinatingly, the French concept of religious freedom developed in a radically different way from that in the US. The strong anti-religious impulse of the revolution led to the persecution and execution of tens of thousands of Christians. The civil constitution of the clergy forcibly placed the church under the rule of the state. It limited both conscience and free exercise. And then in a stage of the revolution referred to as de-Christianization, the revolution then attempted to obliterate Christianity completely and tried to actually replace it using their own state-imposed cults that they invented. The cult of the supreme being, uh, which we can see a lovely uh, festival dedicated to the cult of the supreme being up there. That's a fascinating story, but time doesn't permit me to explore it today. Well, I want now to draw these threads together and talk in this little last section a little bit about our own context and our own history here in Australia, because I think this sets the stage really well for our current situation. So I've got different images there relating to Australia. Now, as we know, some aspects of religious freedom are partially protected in section 116 of our constitution, which reads, the Commonwealth shall not make any law for establishing any religion or for imposing any religious observance or for prohibiting the free exercise of any religion. And no religious test shall be required as a qualification for public office or public trust under the Commonwealth. Australia is also signatory to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, whose Article 18 protects freedom of religion, as does the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Interestingly, there's been something of a process of secularisation over the course of several centuries. While all three of these legal documents make no explicit reference to God, they emerge from a tradition that grounds the natural rights they speak of on the idea that all human beings are equal and entitled to these rights because those human beings are created by God. My current research is revealing that there's a rich debate in the public sphere in colonial Australia about freedom of conscience and freedom of religion. And interestingly, this debate was engaged in by people across the religious and the political spectrums. In the late 1840s, the radical newspaper, The People's Advocate, which is published in Sydney, discussed the case of Lionel de Rothschild. De Rothschild became the first practicing Jew to sit in uh, the British Parliament as a member of the House of Commons. But taking up his seat in Parliament required Rothschild to swear a Christian oath. And so for, in order for Rothschild to be able to take up that seat in all good conscience, he had to be granted the kind of conscientious objection, the ability to not have to swear that oath. And it's particularly significant in this illustration that religious liberty was not just used to protect Christians. And so in that radical newspaper, we have all kinds of discussions about how important it is that Lionel de Rothschild be granted this freedom not to actually articulate that Christian oath. It's also significant in this colonial debate that this colonial debate, even when used to protect the religious freedom of non-Christians, was framed by this natural rights tradition that I've been talking about this morning, this natural rights tradition of Christian thought. There's a strong intellectual tradition in Australia that was wrestling with these questions and drawing upon those same ideas that we saw the American founders draw upon, for example. So when the People's Advocate, that newspaper I mentioned, vociferously advocated for the removal of legal disabilities against Rothschild, it did so in reference to a tradition which dated back, and I quote the newspaper here, 18 and a half centuries ago to the mountains of Judea. So it was very conscious of where these ideas, where these freedoms came from. I want to now have a look a little bit later in the 20th century at another interesting little vignette, an episode of Australian history. And actually the pictures, the other pictures on the, the PowerPoint up there illustrate this episode. This one is particularly significant because it constitutes, I think, the earliest case of an argument for the religious freedom of Indigenous Australians. In 1927, a businessman brought to Melbourne a collection of sacred stones, or terengi, from the Arente people in Central Australia. It soon emerged that the stones were probably stolen and were of considerable religious significance to the Arente people. The idea was that the stones would probably be sold to collectors on the, on the private market. There were some calls for the stones to be given to a museum, but then a public campaign emerged arguing that the stones ought to be returned to the Arente people. And at the forefront of this campaign were several evangelical Christians, including the Ngarindjeri leader, David Uniapon, as well as the Anglican Archbishop of Melbourne, who was also an evangelical, Harrington Clare Lees, and John Henry Sexton, the secretary of the Aborigines Friends Association. 
Together with Yamba, who was an Aboriginal man representing the Arente people, this group began to argue that the Terengi ought to be returned on the basis that Aborigines, like all human beings, were entitled to their sacred objects of worship. And the key claim they made was that Indigenous practices and places of worship ought to be afforded the same protection as Christian cathedrals. When we analyse the arguments presented by the Indigenous leaders and the non-Indigenous leaders, it becomes clear that they're basically underpinned by the same premises. They all make what is essentially a natural law argument about religious freedom. And the argument is, in essence, that all human beings have the right to the protection of their sacred objects. Since Aborigines are human beings and the Terengi in question are sacred objects, the Terengi ought to be returned to the Arente people as their rightful owners. In August 1927, when the story broke, the Mail, the Adelaide newspaper, gave the most extensive treatment to an Indigenous man called Yamba. And I quote Yamba here being quoted by the Mail in 1927. But listen to the argument he makes, this religious freedom argument. If black man go into white man's yard and take marble stone, black man gets shot. When, when white man takes black man's stone from Rudmanic Cave, that was the cave from which it was stolen, black man takes it, black man kills him. Then the male went on to quote Yamba explaining, if black man dies, the Terengi stone is put in his cave. Where Terengi stone put, he stays. That place is sacred to black man. Terengi stones that white man took are the same as white man's tombstone. It's clear what Yamba is trying to say here. He's basically drawing two analogies. The first pertains to the stone's character as property, right? This is his claim that the Terengi were analogous to the marble stone in the white man's backyard. And the second pertains, the second analogy that, that Yamba is drawing pertains to the Terengi's status as a sacred object. This is his claim that the Terengi were analogous to the white man's tombstone, which in Yamba's mind he associates with it being sacred because it's associated with death. Yamba's argument implied that rights to both property and sacred things are natural. He made no reference to any positive law, either his own indigenous customary law or British law, in order to claim this right. And nor did the people's appeal, nor did the appeal to the Arente's people's status as subjects of the British Crown make any argument, nor did anyone make any argument about that either. Rather, Yamba implied that the right to the protection of sacred property existed naturally and universally. It applied to both whites and Aborigines regardless of race. And this was the basis upon which he could draw those analogies between stealing the Terengi and stealing either a white man's stone, marble stone, or his tombstone. Yamba wasn't the only Indigenous leader making an argument for the return of the Terengi on the basis of natural rights. The newspaper reports of David and Iapon, whose picture we see up there, that of his appeals to the Aborigines Protection League claimed that Uniapon described the incident of one of theft from a sanctuary. Like Yamba, David Uniapon insisted upon the character of the stones as sacred and as property. And also like Yamba, Uniapon made no recourse to any kind of British law or any entitlements based on the status of Aborigines as subjects of the British Crown. This is particularly significant because all the other arguments about Indigenous rights and so forth generally tend to be argued in the context of their status under the British Crown. So this is a natural rights argument. And this episode, which has never been studied by historians of religious freedom or of Indigenous rights for that matter, I think is a really important illustration of the fact that a vast spectrum of Australians, from Jews to the radical left, like we've seen, or to Indigenous people, have passionately engaged with and defended religious freedom. Well, I think this is a good point to bring us into the present situation in Australia and to draw a couple of conclusions. Despite the heated contemporary public debate and what Michael described as the, the crisis at the moment of religious freedom, I think we actually lack a rich historical understanding of the development of religious rights in Australia. And as a consequence, many in the general public hold misconceptions about what religious freedom is, where it comes from, and why it matters. Now, my paper this morning, of course, has been a very rapid overview of a very broad sweep of history. But my point is that when we learn about the history of religious freedom, we can actually enrich our public discussions. We learn, for example, that religious freedom has actually been used to protect groups across the religious spectrum in Australia. Part of its importance, therefore, is that it is essential for a contemporary multi-faith democracy like our own. We also learn that freedom of conscience uh, and freedom of religion and their rights of free exercise associated with them have historically been instrumental 
in shaping the origin of all those other rights, which we now consider human rights as well, freedom of the press, freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom to gather, freedom to address the government, redress for grievances and so forth. So this is the kind of broad public importance, I think, of learning something about the history of religious freedom. It can actually enrich our public debate. And then I think finally I'll conclude with saying that on a deeper level, I would suggest that freedom of religion is essential because it enables us to wrestle with life's most profound questions, to be truth seekers. We see this historically. I think we've seen it in these episodes that I've talked about this morning. And this ability to be truth seekers, I think, lies at the heart of what it is to be human. Thanks very much. Thank you.